Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. When people first begin to take the Word of God seriously as catechumens, it's often the commandments that we pay special attention to first and foremost. Before, it didn't seem important to know what God said as long as you didn't get caught in the shame of the world. But now, as newborn children of God, they want to straighten out things with God. They know that they must be, as the psalmist says, both hearers and doers of the word. And so they put the Ten Commandments in their yard, little statues, or on the courthouses carved into the wall or in a painting. Maybe even memorize those Ten Commandments in their hearts. Of course, that's probably true for you who were catechized here. You may be not, unable to remember all the scriptures attached to absolution or baptism or the Lord's Supper, but I bet with some struggle you could recall all the commandments. And that's not a bad place to start. Jesus told the rich young ruler, we'll hear in a few weeks, who asked him what he must do to gain eternal life, Jesus said, keep the commandments. But then it happens repeatedly that people believe that, that from that moment forward, they have that possibility, that agency to become better. It will be easier now that they know the commandments to live a good Christian life. All they need to do is follow the rules better. And in the greatest deceit, some believe that they are successful and can say to themselves, as Paul said about it when he was a Pharisee, that they are, as regards righteousness under the law, blameless. But the scriptures say that we do not understand ourselves rightly. We do not hear the law lawfully. We mis the mistake is that we compare ourselves to others so that we can excuse our own lawlessness. Perhaps we can properly say that we're not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, politicians, and lawyers. It seems necessary to judge other people. How else are we going to be found righteous? It could just be, they could be just as good as we are, of course, if they wanted to. But it's pr precisely because we judge others that Jesus says today that we ourselves are judged. This shows that we have not taken the law of God seriously. We have not heard the law lawfully. We have arbitrarily chosen what we will use as our standard, but have lost the most important thing. Just as the Pharisees, well, they kept the law, they thought, with the tithe of mint and dill and cumin, but neglected, Jesus says, the weightier things, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Matthew 7 and Luke 6. Therefore, Jesus today reminds us that it is he who judges others, and those who do so, who judge others instead of him, will themselves be judged. The Christian should not, of his own accord, judge others. Still, there are those who sit in office with particular God-given authority, be it the president, the mayor, the councilman, the judge, the house father, the school teacher, the preacher. They're all given to judge, to punish, and to pass sentence. Not of themselves, not because everyone has that authority, but rather by their office. Romans 13. It would be hardly fitting for a subject to say to his superior, a child to his father, or a pupil to his school teacher, or a thief to the executioner, you remember what Jesus said, be merciful, judge not, condemn not, etc. So that's not what Jesus is talking about. Those offices were given by God, offices of law to exercise the law. If an authority, ruler, judge, or house father were to practice pure mercy and not be serious about administering punishment, the world would be full of wicked villains in no time. No one would be safe. Moreover, same for the preacher who has 
the office of judge. If a preacher should hold his peace regarding false doctrine, lies, error, iniquity, and vice, individual Christians and the congregation's faith would be attacked constantly and maybe even undermined. Christ says the word is what judges them. And so Jesus judges by his word, John 12. Ah, but you say, I can hear you. What about those times when the one given to be judged by God fails to do the job? What about, I don't know, the Department of Justice acting unjustly? What about when their judgment is faulty or wrong? When, what about when they make the wrong verdict? Can't I just step in and voice my opinion and take over for them? Well, that's nothing new, to have an opinion of others. It's our sinful nature, after all. But we are given to keep our mouths shut if we have no authority to judge. But of course now, today, this is the preferred method to rule in our time. Not under authority given, but rather to, well, be judged in the court of public opinion. We the people are manipulated, controlled, cajoled, and indoctrinated by all of our media, broadcast, social, and otherwise, to judge others. Everything is about having your opinion and telling the world. Judging. We are the court of public opinion, which must be won if you're going to win most criminal cases. It has much bearing on what the courts decide. Those judges are swayed by what you think they should do, regardless of the actual evidence in the case or what is truly right and just. And worse yet, we take matters into our own hands then with vigilante justice. You say, I'm not Batman. Well, no. But do you defame, libel, slander, and destroy others' reputation? The reputation of your neighbors? Judging them? All the while thinking it is just and right to do so? Again, what's often missing, and what's helpful this weekend as our nation celebrates its founding, is the distinction between the person and the office. Distinction between what is given to each individual person and what is specifically given to the offices established by God. That has to be sharply distinguished. Jesus said today, individuals are prohibited from judging and sentencing. But for those who occupy the office, judging, sentencing, and punishing are permitted. And yes, they make mistakes. It's not always done, well, even in a godly way, never mind in a just way. So when Christ says, judge not, condemn not, he's talking about you, not the judges and the magistrates, the president, the Congress, Department of Justice, and all of its agencies, FBI, CIA, whatever. He's talking about you, judge not, condemn not. And what he's then specifically getting after is gossips, slanderers, those who bear planks and judge splinters, who pass sentence on others without authority and do so out of malice, hatred, and wicked intent. They speak, but they have no authority to do anything about it. So they complain and whine about others and fail to actually take responsibility for themselves. I wish that person would die or have this or that punishment, they say. I'd like to see them do the perp walk. I'd like to see them thrown into prison. What is this if not usurping judgment from God and the authorities he's established? Indeed, sinning against both the law of nature and God's own revealed law and condemning oneself in the process. For if you hate your brother, you are a murderer, Jesus says, according to John, and repeated then by John, the apostle, 1 John. And much more is he who judges, sentence, and condemns his brother a murderer when such things are not committed by right to him in his office. So, according to Jesus today, he who takes the commandment seriously will cease comparing himself to others. The law demands instead that we compare ourselves with God. We ought to be perfect as he is perfect, merciful as he is merciful, holy as he is holy. That's the law heard lawfully. And the law then does not allow us to be satisfied with ourselves. It always accuses. 
The knowledge of sin comes to us through that law. And thus our mouth is stopped, and we all stand guilty before God. Honest and earnest law keepers of Jesus' day saw the same. Remember I mentioned that rich young ruler. He knew that something was lacking in him or he wouldn't have come to Jesus in the first place. Even though he had done all that could be asked of him as a good man, at least in the eyes of the world. And it was the elders among the Jews who stole away first, who ran away disturbed in their conscience by what Jesus said. That he who was without sin among them should cast the first stone at that woman caught in adultery. He who was without sin should cast the first stone. But they all fled, disturbed. If the law of God or the commandments have helped us to see that we do not live up to the standards that God has established, and we have then no right to judge others, well, then they can further aid us in, the matter, in a matter that's even more important. Standing accused, judged by God, is not the proper work of God's word or of his congregation and his preachers. God's law, as Paul says in Galatians 3, is to be a tutor to Christ. A tutor to Christ, Galatians 3. That is, the law can begin to teach us to listen seriously to God's proper work, the better word, the good news, the gospel. He who allows for whatever compelling reason God has to judge him will then begin to listen anew to the Savior who does not judge, who forgives. Not because Jesus needs forgiveness and not because he has no occasion to judge, but because he has already taken upon himself your destiny, your sin, and has died in your place. The judgment rendered. That's what we fail to understand and believe. Why aren't we to judge others? Not because they don't need judgment, but because we are not the final judge. That's God the Father. And he has already exacted that judgment upon his son, Jesus, in our place and also in our neighbor's place. Why judge your neighbor if Jesus has already judged him forgiven? The cross of Christ is the final judgment for sin, even for, for the most wicked transgressor, the most unjust. Those who refuse to hear the judgment of God's word, the Spirit's working repentance and faith, and the forgiveness of sins for their planks or specks in their eyes, well, they will be offended by Jesus and they will stumble across him. But for you who have heard, been repented, and believe the verdict of sins forgiven in Christ, you are judged not guilty, saved eternally. What good news. And what better news could you actually give to your neighbor? Not gossip, slander, libel, judging them, either to their face or to others, but rather, what could you possibly want more for your fellow neighbor than to be a Christian? That one who you formerly were so quick to destroy, now to forgive them in the name of Jesus, with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over into their bosom. That's what the work of the church is all about. And that's what distinguishes us from all civil authority, whose only job is to judge. Here, you are judged not guilty always and forever in the forgiveness of Jesus. May God work repentance in your hearts and give you to live in this forgiveness, and in turn, then, love and serve your neighbor with Christ's forgiveness too. In Jesus' name. Amen.